Well, hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Happy Easter. Who is happy to be in the church this morning for Easter? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Let's go, Lord, in prayer this morning. Father, we come to you and we thank you. We celebrate today, Father God, because we know that you are alive and reign forevermore. And we just worship you today. We set our eyes on you today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's worship. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide Come on, it was my tomb It was my tomb Come on, till I met you Till I met you You called my name to your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day now your mercy has saved come on my soul now your freedom now your freedom is all that I know. The old made you, the old made you. Jesus, Jesus, when I met you. Come on, you called my name. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day come on I needed rescue I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm Come on, I have a future. My eyes are open, cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name. to your glorious day come on we're gonna sing that bridge again this morning i needed rescue i needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of you come on i needed i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the end and i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open because when you call my name come on i ran out of that grave hallelujah out of the darkness into 
your glorious name. You called my name. Glorious Come on, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord today. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captain and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm, come on. You'll be faithful forevermore, and you have done great things. And I know you will do it again, for your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. God above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Come on, sing it again, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. We worship you today. Hallelujah. Are you ready? You know, our words are very powerful. And so I want everybody to repeat this word, say everything, everything. And, anything. and anything. What does that leave out? Nothing. Nothing, right? Everything and anything. You know, I saw a sign the other day on a billboard, I'm not going to say where, but it said that 
we need to love up on the children like Jesus did. And when I saw that, it didn't sit very well with me because the word did is a past tense as is it is no more. And so I said, that's actually not true because I don't know about you, but I saw my Jesus loving up on a whole bunch of children yesterday. Amen? Amen? And that's what he does. He, he uses us to continue his work. We continue what Jesus began to do and teach. But is, there was also some very important words that Jesus, the last three words that he spoke while he was still alive, when he said, it is finished. Jesus finished the work that the Father had sent him to do here on this earth. But when he said it was finished, it actually didn't mean that it was over. It just stepped into a new era where Jesus ascended and he's seated at the right hand of the Father so that he is able to pour out all of the blessings that God has in store for his children. All of those who call upon his name. And so in the message translation in 2 Corinthians, it says God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything more than just ready to do what needs to be done. So that you're ready to do more than what needs to be done done. So I ask you this morning as we prepare to give, are you ready? Are you ready this morning? Are you ready for whatever God has in store for you? You know, it doesn't matter what we encounter because it says that we already have, come on now, everything. So whatever we encounter means anything And so it means that you're already thoroughly equipped for anything that God calls you to do because God wants to bless His children. So as the ushers are coming forward this morning, if you need an envelope, be sure and raise your hand. Three more powerful words. He is risen. Amen. My Jesus is alive and he lives inside of me and he lives inside of you. And that's what we have to show the world that he is alive and he still has a mission here on this earth to work through his children. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your ultimate plan of victory that you've given to each and every one who call upon your name through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the blessings. We thank you that we are thoroughly furnished. That every good work that you've called us to do, we already have everything that we need that we'll never encounter a situation to where we don't have it when we call upon you. Bless everyone as they give this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You can remain seated this morning as we sing this song. But as we sing this song, I want you to think back to what your life was like before you accepted Jesus into your heart. We just thank, we just thank Jesus. We just thank Him for the blood that He applied. We thank You that He washed us white. And we just thank Him that He saved our lives. So let's worship the Lord this morning. As a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, 
you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owed broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus it has washed me wide thank you jesus you have saved my life you brought me from the darkness into glorious light you took my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again come on and now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood If all of the heaven 
hands are singing along with the saints and the elders in glorious song and the praises they sing never seem to get old then i'll stay here forever singing holy 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 lord god almighty over all you Jesus, you're guiding me to your will, to your will. Come on, if all of the heavens, if all of the heavens are singing along with the saints and the elders, in glorious song and the praises they sing never seem to get old, then I'll stay here forever singing, holy, holy.
taking this place I stand holy ground holy ground we worship you we honor you Lord we thank you Lord we thank you Lord holy holy we worship you Jesus So holy Jesus, we honor you, Lord. We worship you. We honor you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the we Holy Ghost. You, Hallelujah. Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory because you're the most high. Hallelujah. You know, in the Bible, there's a book, the book of Ruth. And in it, it tells a story of the kinsman redeemer. And in that story, Ruth goes to the threshing, threshing floor. And Boaz comes and he spreads his robe over. I'm so glad that Jesus has spread his robe of righteousness over us. Ruth was not a Jew. She was from outside the Jewish community. But he spread his robe over her. Just as Jesus has spread his robe of righteousness, of goodness and mercy over every one of us. We're not a Jew by our natural birth, but we have been called to be the children of God. We thank God today for his blessing. How great our God is. And we celebrate today the fact that Jesus is alive. Amen. Well, and our soon coming King. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Praise team. What a wonderful job of worship this morning in just a minute we're going to let the children go to uh, children's church we appreciate Miss Amy and let all the boys and girls let's give them a hand as they go this morning <laughs> amen they're going to have a foundation of faith and uh, I thank brother Stephen that's keeping all right the youth are staying in here today Look at all these boys and girls. We had a good time yesterday. Amen. And we're glad to have you this morning. We have a young man, his first, his first Easter, to be in church with us. And uh, that's uh, little, little Tucker Mac Williams. Uh, he is uh, Tommy and Virginia's uh, little great-grandson, and I know they're proud of him. And so we're glad to have him and his, and his mom. And I know others of you, some have said it's their first time. And uh, I don't see my ushers, maybe the outside. But if you lift your hand before you leave here today, we have a gift for you. And we just say thank you for coming and being with us as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful time it is. If you have your Bible, you can turn to the book of John, the 11th chapter. I'm going to read verses 25 and 26. This is Jesus uh, approaching the tomb of Lazarus, who was a friend. Uh, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. In fact, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus were Jesus' friends. He often stayed at their home when he was in Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus gets word that Lazarus is very sick, but he continues his meeting. And, you know, all the way, you know, the disciples are trying to figure out what's going on. And they said, well, you know, uh, Jesus said, well, he sleeps. And they said, well, if he's sleeping, he's doing good. Well, Jesus finally had to say, he's dead. Lazarus is dead. But Jesus went on a mission. And verse 25, Jesus said unto her, this is Jesus speaking to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know, those are powerful words. And today as we celebrate the, the Lord Jesus Christ, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive, uh, that he's alive today, that he was raised from the dead, that he overcame uh, the powers of darkness to uh, reclaim the authority that once belonged to Adam. And uh, the Bible says he carries authority in three dimensions, in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. There's no place that we can find where the name of Jesus does not carry authority. 
See, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is the cornerstone of our Christian faith. If there were no resurrection, then we'd just be wasting our time this morning. The words that I speak would be meaningless. But because Jesus is alive and, and soon will return for us. You know, we have seen such a dramatic change, not only in our country, but in the world over a, a short period of time that the world is moving uh, at rapid pace against everything that the Bible teaches. Everything that we hold holy and dear is being trampled underfoot uh, today. And we're headed in the time that Jesus, Matthew 24, Jesus gives us the signs of his return, that these things will happen before the turn of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ought to lift our hands and say, thank the Lord that these things are coming to pass because the Lord is coming quickly. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today for the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that has redeemed us, that he is our kinsman and redeemer, and he has covered us with his righteousness, and that we're accepted in the beloved. And today, Lord, we celebrate the fact that that 2,000 years ago, almost 7,000 miles from here, Jesus was raised uh, all from the dead, and he is alive, seated at your right hand, wherever it makes intercession for us. As we pray today, Lord God, that the words we speak would be full of the life of the Holy Spirit, and Lord, that you would encourage those that are here in Jesus' precious name. Well, without Jesus, we wouldn't have a living hope, but thank God we have one. Paul writes to the Corinthians. You know, the, the Corinthians, uh, uh, they were pagans. They, they had a lot of things wrong with them. It's amazing that, that they came behind a no spiritual gift. They had every gift of the Spirit operating within this church, even though, you know, they had had a shaded past. God changed them. But, but uh, many of them were being put to death for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's still happening today. So Paul writes to them in uh, chapter 15 and verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. That's, that's just a fact. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus is not raised from the dead. And uh, basically, you could say we race, uh, we'd be wasting our time. First, uh, the next verse, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith also is vain. We wouldn't have anything to put faith in because put, we put our faith in a risen Christ. Then in verse 19, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all men are most miserable. Now realize that Paul, he gave up everything. He had been a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he you know, he gives his pedigree uh, of all the things that he had. Uh, he was well respected. He had been trained by the greatest uh, uh, teacher of his day, Gamaliel. And so he had all the accolades. To, to, he could have been the high priest. Uh, but he gave all that up just to follow Jesus Christ. And because he followed Jesus, he suffered so many things. You know, he was uh, beaten. Uh, he was shipwrecked. He had all these things happen to him because of his faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul said, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then I, my preaching is vain and my life is vain and I've wasted my life for nothing, for no reason. Well, we know different. As I said today, there's still people being martyred for their faith. Here, uh, just a few months ago, uh, in, uh, in Iraq and in that area, there were thousands of Coptic Christians that were uh, put to their death because they would not denounce their faith in Jesus Christ. And from 2000, uh, 2010, uh, one church group estimated there were over a million people that were martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ in some way or another. And so it's estimated that there's at least 100,000. There could be more because there's a lot of people that have faith in Jesus Christ that die. We don't know anything about them. But you know, Jesus knows every one of them. You know, in, in, the, in the scripture, he said that he knows every uh, sparrow that falls from the sky, every plant that dies. God knows everything. You know, the Bible says that he even knows the number of hairs on your head. You ever try to count the number of hairs on your head? It's like the impossible task that God gave to Abraham. He said, you count the stars of heaven, and that's how many descendants you're going to have. And, uh, you know, he probably started, and after a while he lost count because there, there are vast galaxies that we cannot see. We have sent probes out into space, and as far as they can see, it continues to go on and on. Why? Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the only guarantee we have is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Now, Jesus, in this verse of Scripture that we read from John, the 11th chapter, the word that he uses uh, here, it's interpreted resurrection, but it comes from a Greek word. It means the ability to make stand again or to raise from the dead. Jesus said to Martha, I am the one that makes people stand again. He said, I'm the one that raises from the dead. And, and you know, it is that Jesus is still doing that. A couple of weeks ago, we had the women from Teen Challenge. We've had the men. We've had others that have passed through this church that they have had Jesus stand them on their feet again. You know, when he raised Lazarus, he was standing at the entrance of the tomb on his feet. Why? Because Jesus has the power to make us stand again. You know, there, there may be those of you that you have had a failure in life, but I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is able to resurrect your life and give you a new life, and he is able to make you stand again. Amen? You know, there are many times that I have stood uh, at the graveside of, of Christians you know, it's a different thing when we lay a Christian rest because we have the hope of the resurrection. And many times I quote that scripture that, that says uh, that the dead in Christ shall rise first, that, that, that we that are alive and remain be caught up to be with the Lord. And we take comfort in those words, comfort in the fact that Jesus was rose from the dead. See, in the next verse, verse 20, Paul says, But now is Christ risen become the first fruits of, of them that slept. Jesus is alive. Jesus has the power uh, to resurrect us from the dead. And so everybody that has died in Christ, at some point in time, they're going to have a resurrection. It's not the end. You know, when we lay a Christian to rest, it's not the end. We would say so long for a little while, but soon and very soon, the kingdom of this world will become the kingdoms of the Lord. And it's closer now than it's ever been. That we're, we're at the, the very close of the last days. Now, some people don't know when the last days began. Well, it began in the book of Acts when the church was created. For uh, Peter said, in the last days that God would pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. And he says, you know, your, your uh, old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall prophesy on, on the handmaidens and your servants. He'll pour out his spirit. And God's been pouring out his spirit by salvation and by the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. Over and over again, for thousands of years, God's been pouring out His Spirit. But we have come to the very end, the conclusion. We've come to the end of days when the Lord Jesus Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. You know, the, the Bible tells us about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if I tried this morning, there's so many avenues that as a minister of the gospel you could take about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, I'm just going to list a few for you this morning. I, I'm, I'm going to preach about the resurrection. I want to talk to you about your personal resurrection, that, that what God is going to do from you. You know, when Jesus was raised from the dead, we, we have the, the record of what happened in, in, in the, the spirit realm, that Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he rose. Well, inside this tomb that was sealed with a seal of Rome, the power of God exploded so powerfully within that tomb that the earth shook. It was an earthquake. Someone said the other day they had a little earthquake, uh, 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 three points on the Richter scale, just this little ways from us. But there was a powerful earthquake. Why? Because the power of God exploded inside that tomb and the spirit of Jesus was reunited with his body and the power of God caused that lifeless body to live again. And he, and he healed the wounds. He left the scars, but he healed the wounds. And Jesus came forth. He wasn't any longer just a flesh and blood man, but, but he, he had flesh, but his blood was shed for the remission of our sin. And the angels that are coming down, they come down and they break the seal of Rome and they roll that stone and Jesus walks out of the tomb. Now they carried him in, but Jesus walked out. I heard somebody talk about a man that was well known, was an actor, and a, you know, he was a big muscle man, that he walked in the hospital, but they carried him out. Well, they carried Jesus in the tomb, but he walked out. It's a whole lot of different because Jesus is the strong man. Amen. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that happen. You know, Mary and the women came uh, to attend to the body of Jesus because he was buried in such a hurry that they didn't get to do what they needed to do. 
And when they come, they discover that the tomb is open and it's empty. And they think they have moved the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And an angel intervenes and, and, and tells them, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because he's risen. And instructs them to go tell the disciples. Well, how they run and tell Peter and John that Jesus is alive and they don't believe it. So they run to see the empty tomb and they examine the tomb. Peter, Peter examines everything about the tomb. Later that day, Jesus appears to his followers on the road to Emmaus. Then later that day, he appears to, to the disciples. They, they were hiding. They were inside of their house with the doors locked. The shades pulled down because they were afraid of the Jews and they're afraid of the Romans. So that they would come and crucify them. And Jesus appears to them. And first they think, well, it's an apparition. It's a ghost. But Jesus said, you got any bread? You got any fish? Jesus eats bread, he eats fish, and they know that he's alive. Amen. That he's a living being. Amen. He's not an apparition. Well, Thomas wasn't with him. A few days later, you know, Thomas said, well, except I can put my fingers in his nail prints and, and touch his ribbon side, I won't believe it's the Lord. Well, Thomas is with him a few days later, and the Lord appears to him. And he says, Thomas, come and put your hands on my womb and quit doubting. You know, Jesus goes on to say something that's important for us. He said, blessed because you have seen, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us. Nobody in here has seen Jesus at any time that I know of. No vision of Jesus. But Jesus is real and we believe in him. You know, it, it is that Jesus, uh, uh, later, Peter and some of the disciples were fishing, and, and he calls out from the seashore, from, and he says, let your nets down on the other side, and they do it. And when they do, they have a net sinking, uh, uh, net breaking, sinking load of fish. And Peter knows there's only one guy I know the fish is like that, it's the Lord. And, and, and Jesus you know, Jesus restores him, and Jesus gives him a mission uh, to, to preach the gospel to the Jews. Jesus for 40 days. You know, it's interesting. Throughout the Bible, there's some, there are recorded 40 days, 40 days. It's interesting that Jesus proved himself by many infallible proofs that he was very much alive for, for 40 days. See, we just have a few of the incidents that are happening. We don't know what else Jesus did to prove that he was alive. He may, have, he may have appeared to the high priest. He may have appeared to, to uh, uh, the Roman emperor Pilate. We don't know. But over a 40-day period, he proved himself. And then when he ascends on high on the, off of the Mount of Olives, there are 500, at least 500 men that witness the ascension of Jesus Christ into the heavens. So, you know, any of those things, we could, we, could, we could go on for hours and hours and days and weeks preaching about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but that's, that's not what I want to touch on this morning. You know, I want to touch on the fact that in the Bible, there are 12 resurrections. There are three in the Old Testament. Now, there was a prophet by the name of Elijah that had... Uh, he had a resurrection. He raised a, a, a widow's son. And he had a, 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 a disciple that followed him. And uh, his name was Elisha. And, and Elisha said, uh, you know, he said, I'm leaving today. Elijah says to Elisha, I'm leaving today. What do you want from me? He said, I want a double portion of the spirit rest on you. And he said, well, you've seen a hard, you asked a hard thing, but if you see me when I go, it'll be granted unto you. And, you know, they try to separate him from Elijah, but he sees him. And the mantle of Elijah falls on him, and he has almost a double portion. Now, one of the things, he too raises a widow's son, just like Elijah did. But he dies, and he's one miracle short of a double portion. But, you know, God is not slack concerning his promises as we count slackness. You know, God didn't need Elisha to be alive to give him the double portion. And so, one day, there, there are guys taking this friend of theirs out to be buried, and they see the enemy coming, and so they throw him in the first tomb they can find. They roll the stone away, they throw him in, and it happens to be the tomb of Elisha. And when he touches the, the bones of Elijah, the power of God quickens him, and he's made alive. 
So there's three resurrections in the Old Testament. Jesus had three resurrections in his ministry. You know, Jesus stopped a funeral procession one day, and a, a, a widow from Nan. And this little widow woman doesn't even call her name. We don't know her son's name. But Jesus raises him from the dead and restores him to life. And, and, you know, that widow, she's rejoicing because her only son is alive and she has hope. Then Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. You know, he says to arise. You know, uh, he made a believer out of Jairus. So Jairus was a believer. He thought, well, Jesus can make her well. They said, don't bother Jesus because she's dead. But Jesus said, hold on to your faith. Don't say anything. Just hold on to your faith. Jesus went and raised her up. And the last person Jesus raised from the dead was Lazarus at the tomb of Lazarus. He said, roll the stone away. Well, they didn't want to do that. They said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. His body's stinking. We, you know, we're sorry we fussed at you. But they rolled the stone away. He said, roll that stone away. And, and there was Lazarus raised from the dead. Now, there are three resurrections in the book of Acts. Darkness was raised. Uh, from the dead. You know, she, she, she was beloved by everybody and she died. Well, she was raised from the dead. Uh, uh, Paul one night was preaching and a young man fell out the window and uh, he, he's dead. Well, pa- Paul stops his sermon and goes down and, and, and ministers to him and God raised him from the dead. And the third person that was raised from the dead was Paul himself because he was stoned and left outside the city of Lystra, but God raised him from the dead. Now, those that were raised from the dead in the Old Testament, those that were raised from the dead in the ministry of Jesus, and those raised from the dead in the book of Acts, guess what? They all died again. They're not with us anymore. But I want to focus for a few minutes on the most important resurrection there is, the resurrections that take place in the book of Revelation. You know, John, who is the revelator, he wrote the book of Revelations, and later he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, after he had been exiled on Patmos, the the emperor of Rome died, and uh, he was returned, and uh, he lived to be 90-some-odd years old before he went to glory. So we see the resurrections in the 4th chapter of the book of Revelation. John writes, and he hears a voice that says, Come up higher. Now, that's the resurrection of of the Lord Jesus Christ resurrecting his church. Now, Paul goes into more detail in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter verse 51 through 53. He describes the first resurrection. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This is the first resurrection. Now, the first resurrection has two parts. That's the reason I said there are three resurrections in the book of Revelation. The first is the resurrections that we normally think of, but it's not finished. Just because the church and the saints have been called out, God remembers His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God will focus his attention on the nation of Israel. And the Bible tells us that there will be 12,000 Jewish men from the 12 tribes of Israel that will be anointed by the Holy Spirit called to witness that Jesus Christ was and is the Messiah that they look for. Now over a period of time, uh, about three and a half years, they will all be killed except for two. Now most Bible Scholars say that the two witnesses that are left alive are Enoch and Elijah. Now, if you know the story of Enoch, the Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not. He didn't die. God sent his own chariot to pick up Elijah. He didn't die. Now, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. So they got to die at some point in time. And so scholars believe, I'm not a scholar, They believe that the two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah, the last two that left. And uh, it's important because of the last two people that are going to be take part in the first resurrection, the one that we need a part of, the one that you better be a part of because you won't like the other one. 
I, I want to read from the book of Revelation, the 11th chapter, verse 7. And when they had finished their testimony, see, they're going to testify that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The beast that ascended out of the bottom of the pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which is called, uh, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. And, 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 the, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies be put in a grave. They're going to make an example out of it. You know, we see that today in society. People want to make an example out of people. And so they have created so much havoc, not only in Israel, but all over the world, how about the miraculous powers of God that they're going to make an example of. Now, if you read the Exodus, the, the things that happen, the plagues that happen, some of them are the very same plague that Elijah and these 144,000 will bring on earth. At the command of God. They that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. But the story is not finished here. I like what Paul Harvey used to say. Now here's the rest of the story. And after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood on their feet. You know, that's where Jesus sits. He said, I am the one that has the power to stand people back on their feet. They stand on their feet, and great fear fell on them that saw them. Well, we know how that is today. I, I, I remember reading a commentary back before television, the Internet. Uh, they would try to figure out, well, maybe the telegraph will be so advanced that people will hear the message, but they will see them. You know, it's nothing for us to see things that happen thousands of miles away from us uh, by television. So the world will see them. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come unto them, come up hither. And they sent up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In Revelation 20 and 6 it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. See, there's two parts. There's the resurrection that Paul talks about in the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. It is the resurrection of the church. And then here, uh, we have just read that the resurrection of those that are called to be witness of, the, of Jesus Christ and his lordship to the nation of Israel, they will be raised up. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. But there's one more resurrection, the last resurrection. See, everybody is ever born on planet Earth. You were born in this world, but guess what? You all have a point in time that you're going to be raised from the dead. You know, the, the Bible says this in Revelations uh, 20 and 11. And I saw a great bright throne and him that sat on whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Talk about the one that created them. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There's, there's the last resurrection and the second death. You know, Jesus is going to come in the clouds of glory and we're going to reign with him for a millennium. That's a thousand years. The millennial reign of Christ. And the wicked dead, they're going to be where they are in torment until the great white throne. Then God himself is going to ascend from heaven and set up his judgment seat and people are going to be judged. Now it says they're going to be judged out of a couple of books. One is the books of the works of the life. Everything that anybody has ever done that's wicked and evil is going to be heralded before them. You did this, you did this, you did that. You know, we know how the world is today. You know, there, there are people that are murderers. Uh, there, there are people that are kidnappers, people that, that do all kinds of things. Hideous people. Things that you would never in your life think of doing, they do it. Why? Because they're bound by sin. 
You know, we had those ladies here a few weeks ago, and they told a little bit about their life. And it was hard for them to tell that, you know, I was bound by drugs. But they didn't tell you everything they did in order to supply that habit. And you, you probably wouldn't want to know because it was hideous. And they were ashamed of it. But Jesus took their shame away and gave them a new life. He put them back on their feet. But you know, there are people that do not want the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one aspect of the millennial reign of Christ, at the close of the millennial reign of Christ, the Bible says that Satan is loose for a short period. And he's going to go throughout the whole earth. And everybody that didn't like the millennial reign of Christ, is, he's going to gather them up. You know, there, there are people who are going to think, well, you know, we need a good, you know, honky-tonk, or we need, you know, a house of prostitution. We need that. We need that, and we can't have that because of Jesus, and we're going to be with you. And you know what? They're all going to be destroyed. Then the great right throne judgment comes. And everybody that is not part of the first resurrection is going to take part in that last resurrection. You know, Joshua said years ago, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, I don't make a decision for you. The choice is ours. Every person makes a decision. I can't make a decision for my wife. She doesn't make a decision for me. I'm an individual in the sight of God. I make my choice. She makes her choice. You know, she, she could go to heaven, and I could, I could do things. I could renounce Christ. I, I could lose my relationship with the Lord, I could get end up in hell. I'm not going to, but I could. It's my choice. I choose. So you choose which resurrection you want to be a part of. You want to be a part of the first resurrection where Jesus is Lord, or you want to be a part of the second resurrection where Jesus is your judge. See, the choice is ours. Now, you know, I would certainly hope that everybody of the sound of my voice today has made the choice. I want to be a part of that first resurrection. If I go by the way of the grave, I have a hope in Jesus Christ, the living Christ, that, that I, will, I will live again. That, that there's a day coming when the, I'll hear the voice of God and I'll be reunited with my body, but it's going to be changed. It will become, become like his body, a glorious body. Amen glorified body that Jesus had. You know, the doors were locked, the windows were shut, and Jesus appeared in it. That's why they thought he was a spirit. Jesus ate bread and fish. And when he left, the bread and fish wasn't laying on the ground. He took them with him. Had a supernatural body. We're going to have one. Paul says it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we're going to be like him when he does appear. Amen. We're, we're going to have a glorified body. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for his goodness and mercy today. Thank God for his grace. We celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. Amen. And, and he's alive forevermore. The, the apostle Paul, he prayed a number of prayers. One he prayed in, in the book of, of Ephesians chapter 1. And, and it, you know, he, he talks about uh, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, was given to him. And what he can give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Christ, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance of saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. When he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. See, it, it took the mighty power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. Now last week I talked about the fact that David faced a giant. Well, Jesus faced a bigger giant. He faced Satan and all these fallen angels. Because Satan had the authority that belonged to Adam, he had it. I suppose he thought somehow he used that as a stepping stone how to overcome God. And he certainly didn't want Jesus to take that authority away from him, but that's exactly what he did because he had authority over death, hell, and the grave, and he ascended and I can tell you that every, every spiritual force that could hold Jesus down tried to hold Jesus in the grave, but they didn't have the power to overcome the power of God, and Jesus rose from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. You know, Paul writes, he was an eyewitness of the Lord. He writes to the Christians, I was an eyewitness of the Lord. I've seen the Lord. Well, you know, he did a lot of bad things, but Jesus appeared to him, and he saw the Lord. He said, I'm an eyewitness of the Lord. 
Many, many years later, when John is on the Isle of Patmos, now John was the last living disciple. And he said, I, I John, I'm going to read that to you. He said, I, John, John was a fellow prisoner. He said, I, John, a fellow prisoner, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, sometimes people, they interpret that, say well, he was in the presence of the Lord. The ruler of the Roman Empire declared himself to be God. He set aside a day that he was to be worshipped as God. That's what he's talking about. But, but John was caught away in the spirit on the day that the emperor was to be worshipped. And he said, I heard a voice as a trumpet behind me that said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Well, John recognized that voice. He'd heard it many times. It was the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many, many years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's much alive. And John sees him as he's never seen him before. In all of his splendor and all his glory, as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, as our great apostle and high priest, and he said, I want to give you a message to the churches that you've established. And then after, in the fourth chapter, he said, come up high. I want to show you heavenly things. And that's where we're headed. We're headed to heaven. Today, we're going to honor the Lord because we're going to do something very special. We're going to receive the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. Now, Jesus said that he would not celebrate this feast with us until he did it in his Father's house. You know, Jesus ate the bread and fish, but he didn't receive the communion. One of these days, we're going to be in heaven, and we're going to receive together the whole family of God. What a, what a gathering that's going to be. That we're going to be gathered, and Jesus himself is going to teach and minister to us about the communion, and then we're going to receive it together and rejoice together because we're the redeemed of the Lord, and we will say so. In the, in, the, in the book of Corinthians, now Paul, he wasn't present the night that that happened. And uh, he would have been opposed to Jesus. But he writes this. First of all, in the 28th verse, he said, let a man examine himself. Now, you know, it's important that we know that if we have unconfessed sins... The Bible says if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or maybe you're not a Christian. I, I want you today, and the ushers are going to come, and they're going to uh, pass to you the communion. In the book of Romans, it says that if, if you believe in your heart, and confess your mouth the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Now, that's not hard. You have to believe in your inner man, in your heart, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was, he was killed, he shed his blood, and was raised from the dead for your justification. We're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. But if we confess him, we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, Jesus is, is the Lord of my life, the Bible says you will be saved. Because it goes on to tell us, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth, confession is made on salvation. That, that is how we're born again. Now, that's just the first step uh, of our salvation, but it's an important step. That we are born, not of flesh or blood, but by the will of God. Amen? God's will is that we all become the children of God. Amen? I'm going to read what Paul wrote to the Corinthians because they didn't know anything about the Lord at all till he preached to them. He said, For I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, uh, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death 
until he comes. We're, we're declaring not only Jesus died for us, but Jesus is, is alive forevermore. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Paul is saying, if you just think this is another ceremony, if you just think this is a, you know, a, another uh, commemoration like they had in pagans, as pagans, you, you're going to miss out on the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is alive, and what we're doing is we're showing that he has authority over death, hell, and the grave. That The Bible says he received stripes, and those stripes are for our healing. With his stripes, we are healed, not were, are. I like to say this. The Word tells me that I was, uh, that I was healed almost 2,000 years ago by the stripes of Jesus. So if I was healed, then I am healed. Amen? Well, what if sickness attacks you? Well, the Bible says we're overcomers. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That we declare, I'm the healed. Now, we're not against doctors or medical science. Don't go out here, well, Brother Moffat's against doctors. No, we're not. You know, the devil never, never gave any kind of medical breakthrough to anybody. The sooner you're dead, as far as the devil's concerned, the better. Because he wants to control everything in the earth. And he's running loose like an outlaw. You know, we have a lot of laws on the books. And, uh, you know, there are laws that are against people selling drugs. Well, we have some deputy sheriffs that tell you they sell drugs every day. And there's people that, you know, they go to prison for selling drugs. And you think that'd be a deterrent to somebody. Well, I'm uh, so-and-so went to prison for 20 years. I'm not going to sell drugs. No, they take their place. Because they like the allure of quick money and all that money will buy. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. doesn't say ha not have any money. doesn't say you shouldn't be blessed. But if you worship money, money becomes a God to you, you put it in the wrong place. So you have to keep everything in its place. So today we're going to receive this little wafer that represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was broken, everything that pertains to your life. Jesus, one day his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And one of the things he said, give us this day our daily bread. Bread represents life. Everything that pertains to life and godless, this piece of bread represents that Jesus has covered it all. So let's receive the bread together. Now after the same manner, he took the cup, the cup of the Messiah, and when he had supped, he gave it to the disciples and said, drink all of it. For this this is the New Testament written in my blood. There's a new page that was written in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus ascended on high. He sent the Holy Spirit to establish the church. We're living in the last days. Soon and very soon, we're going to do this in the portals of heaven. But today we receive this blood. Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive it and all that it means to us in Jesus' name. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. There's wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the blood. Today, as we commemorate the fact that Jesus is alive and well, soon and very soon, we're going to see. I like what one minister says, and you can stand to your feet. We're going to be related in just a minute. He says this, and it's written in the Word. In fact, it's in the book of Revelation. That the kingdoms of this world should become the kingdoms of our Lord. Well, he says that often. He says, soon and very soon, the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of our Lord. Well, it's a lot closer than a lot of people think. The Jesus will carry authority. You know, one thing Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, the will of God is going to be done throughout the earth. It's not being done now, but it will be. When, when we come back with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to establish his kingdom physically. And he will rule the whole world. The Bible says he will sub subdue strong nations. 
with the power of his word. Today, as you leave, we leave in faith that soon and very soon the Lord will come for us, catch us away. beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Oh, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What 